Just a heads up, today's episode doesn't get into anything graphic, but should be said that we do discuss some mature themes. Nobody knows that because nobody knows who the Poet Laureate of the United States is. Who is it right now? I don't know. Welcome to the podcast, The Book Isn't Necessarily Better, where we read books and we compare the adaptations made from those books. We're your hosts, Roxanne and Michaela, and we work for the Community Library Network in Northern Idaho. And today I'm excited, well, sad and excited (laughs) to announce that Michaela and I no longer work together on a day to day basis. Michaela has a new job in the district. Want to tell me about it? Yeah, so I now work in the tech services department, which means I no longer work for the Post Falls Library. I actually work for all of the libraries now. The tech services department, you'll probably never see us, but we do a lot of the behind the scenes um, processing, ordering, cataloging, getting all the materials you want uh, cataloged properly and into your hands in all of the libraries. Gee, thanks. You're welcome. (laughs) Uh, Whereas before, I used to do the same job that I do now, which Mm -hmm. is a circulation supervisor. So we work at the front desk and we do adult programming. We all miss you a lot here, but it sounds like you love your new job. I do. It's great. And it fits in with your library degree. Yeah, absolutely. That's awesome. Yeah. Yay. (laughs) Yay. Progress. Cataloging. Hooray. (laughs) (laughs) So we are talking about a hometown hero today. Mm -hmm. Who are we talking about? Today we're going to talk about Sherman Alexi. He is a Spokane Coeur d'Alene tribe member who grew up in Spokane on the Spokane Indian Reservation and now lives in Seattle. But uh, a lot of his writing is about Spokane. For people who are not familiar with our part of the United States, could you describe like where the Spokane tribe is versus the Coeur d'Alene tribe and how it fits in with the cities around here? Sure. You probably at least know that the two cities are named after those tribes. Spokane is in eastern Washington, right on the border, and the reservation is a little bit further west than that. The Spokane. The Spokane Reservation. Mm-hmm. Thank you. And uh, Coeur d'Alene is the bigger city on the west side of the Idaho border. That's where I live. Yes, in the Panhandle. Mm-hmm. And um, they also have a reservation. Which is a little bit south of the city. Right. Yeah, this is the ancestral home of the Spokane and Coeur d'Alene tribes. Mm-hmm. And Sherman Lexi belongs to both of them. Yeah. All right. Before we go any farther, I want to talk about terminology. Obviously, identity and what you want to call yourself as part of a group is incredibly individual. So I did a little background research to make sure that we're being as respectful as possible and respecting how people like to identify themselves. Mm -hmm. So I took this statement that is from the Museum of the American Indian, the Smithsonian Museum, on their terminology page. The question is... What is the correct terminology, American Indian, Indian, Native American, Indigenous, or Native? And they say on the website, all of these terms are acceptable. The consensus, however, is that whenever possible, Native people prefer to be called by their specific tribal name. In the United States, Native American has been widely used, but is falling out of favor with some groups. Native people often have individual preferences on how they'd like to be addressed. So that bearing in mind, normally I think we would probably go with Native American. Mm -hmm. But in this case, Sherman Alexi has made it abundantly clear over the years he doesn't like the term Native American. He prefers the term Indian. He thinks that Native American, quite honestly, is, quote, oxymoronic term born of white guilt. And that technically anyone who was born in North America is a Native American. So all that being said, we're going to use the term Indian, the one that he prefers to be used and how he wants to be identified. Okay. All right, let's get into it. Tell me a little bit about Mr. Alexi. Sherman Alexi, whose full name is Sherman Joseph Alexi Jr., uh, was born in 1966 at a hospital that a lot of you might be familiar with if you do live in the area, Sacred Heart. He was one of six children, and his parents, his dad was a member of the Coeur d'Alene tribe, his mother was Colville, Choctaw, Spokane, and had a little bit of European American ancestry as well. He was born with hydrocephalus, which is kind of crazy. It's where you have extra fluid in your brain. Is it called water on the brain? Yes. Yeah. So as a young child, he had a lot of seizures and uh, did some surgeries and things to fix that. So his health conditions kept him from some rites of passages growing up, which I, th- I think he's got some regrets about. 
hmm. um, in his later life. He also was bullied as a kid uh, because his head was a little bit larger than usual because hmm. he was born with water in his brain. A lot of the kids would call him the globe. Yeah. It, he grew up on the Spokane Indian Reservation, but when he went to high school, he didn't want to go to reservation schools anymore, so he started going to Reardon High School. Guess what their mascot was? Mm-hmm. Something <laughs> not racist. Um, <clears throat> nope, it was <clears throat> something racist. Uh, they were the Reardon High School Indians. Okay. Uh-huh. That's and a lot to unpack for a, a kid like him bit, going there. <laughs> right? Quite a bit. But he joined the basketball team, and he's actually a very good basketball player. And that plays into a lot of his stories. He talks about basketball an inordinate amount. Just like everyone from Spokane. Exactly. <laughs> uh, hoop fest, everybody? Yeah? Yeah. I, me and Roxanne, no. But everybody else. I would assume that a lot of our listeners not from around here don't know anything about hoop fest. Oh, no, no, no. People come from everywhere for hoop fest. It's okay, like a, okay, for us indoor kids, what's for, hoop fest? <laughs> for the indoor kids like me. Uh, Hoop Fest is the nation's largest three-on-three outdoor basketball tournament. Whoop. Whoop. <laughs> um, it goes on usually every year in downtown Spokane. Takes up, like, the entire downtown. You cannot park for the life of you anywhere. And they just have basketball hoops, like, in parking lots and on streets. It's pretty great. Wow. Even for an indoor kid, I think it's kind of cool. That is cool. Yeah. Go sports. <sighs> sports, sports. And because we have a big basketball school here in the area. Mm-hmm. Gonzaga. Which... Sherman Alexi went to college at. Oh, sweet. Did Good he play transition. basketball for them? No, he did not. As okay. far as I know. He did start pre-med at Gonzaga in 1985. Then he was pre-law, and then he left Gonzaga to go to WSU. And what year is he born? 1966. Right about when he was 19. Went to Gonzaga. Left there. Went to WSU. He stopped three credits shy of getting his degree And WSU. WSU is Washington State University. Yes. I'm sorry I keep interrupting you. That's okay. I'm just trying to make sure that people <laughs> not from around here know. At WSU, he got very into poetry. He had a poetry professor who became kind of his mentor, and that became his kind of defining factor. He is more a poet than a novelist, I would say. I could definitely tell that from what I've read. His prose is poetic. Yeah. And we'll definitely talk about it in this one, because I, I actually have some quotes I want to read because they're beautiful. It's just a beautifully written book, but it shows that he is a poet for sure. So later on, he did actually get awarded a degree from WSU. In 2005, he founded Longhouse Media, which is a nonprofit organization that teaches filmmaking skills to Indian youth. In 2012, this is kind of a crazy thing. Arizona, the state of Arizona, Mm -hmm. uh, passed House Bill 2281 which prohibits schools from including any class that, one, promotes the overthrow of the federal or state government or the Constitution, two, promotes resentment toward any race or class, e.g. racism and classism, three, advocates ethnic solidarity instead of being individuals, and four, are designed for a certain ethnicity, which I think we're kind of seeing that again today Hmm. in a lot of states. So here's his response, which I think is really great. In a strange way, I'm pleased that the racist folks of Arizona have officially declared (laughs) in banning me alongside Urea, Baca, and Castillo that their anti-immigration laws are also anti-Indian. I'm also strangely pleased that the folks of Arizona have officially announced their fear of an educated underclass. You give those brown kids some book about brown folks and what happens, those brown kids change the world. In the effort to vanish our books, Arizona has actually given them enormous power. Arizona has made our books sacred documents now. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So he's actually pretty proud to be a band author. I mean, we read banned books here at the library and we love banned authors. We do. So now we get to what I think is probably going to be a theme of today, which is that people are mixed bags. Here we get to, in 2018, Herman Alexi, who has done a lot for Native American filmmakers, who has put a lot of energy and effort into describing the conditions of people on reservations and just trying to elevate people around him. In 2018, he was accused of sexual assault by multiple women. And um, this was during the time he had just written a memoir that featured his mom a lot. It was a lot about him and his mom, who was an alcoholic, so Mm -hmm. was his father. Called You Don't Have to Say You Love Me. Right. Which is really good. It is really good. He had taken a mental health break because the toll of doing the tour for that book was a lot for him. And in the midst of that, the charges came against him for sexual assault. So the Institute of American Indian Acts renamed the Sherman Alexi Scholarship to the MFA Alumni Scholarship. The ALA, which is the American Library Association, was going to award him actually the Carnegie for the memoir, and uh, he declined at the same time they were reconsidering. So okay, he just decided not to make it a big deal. Declined. Mm-hmm. So that's the not so nice 
side of Sherman Alexi. Mm-hmm. But he's married to Diane Tom Harvey, I want to say. I don't actually know how to say her last name. And they have two sons and live in Seattle right now. And this is against a backdrop also. He's won an American Book Award for Reservation Blues, which is his first novel. Mm-hmm. It kind of follows the book we're going to talk about today. He won a National Book Award for Young People's Literature for The Absolutely True Diary of a Part-Time Indian. Which is amazing. Which is a fantastic book. It got rescinded in 2018 in the wake of the allegations. But... The award for it. The award. But originally won that. He won an Odyssey Award in 2008 for that. The audiobook of The Absolutely True Diary. And he's won a Penn Faulkner Award for Fiction for War Dances. I mean, highly lauded... Mm -hmm. writer for sure this is truly only my opinion not speaking for anyone else or any organization i am able to separate art from the artist or Mm -hmm. not even separating art from the artist but taking artistic genius and appreciating it while also knowing that human beings are problematic yeah that's a great way to put it and i think that smoke signals and the book we're talking about today which is the lone ranger and tonto fist fight in heaven i didn't i didn't know if i was switching the first (laughs) two um i think they're absolutely worthy of being talked about in spite of i agree uh you know what the author's been through i agree so with that so let's talk about the book a little bit i'm excited Mm -hmm. Uh, i really do love this book it is a group of short stories and here's the thing oh yeah Okay, so I finished this yesterday. Oh, you did? Great. Yeah, loved it. I didn't realize until I was doing more research on it that it was a book of short stories. I thought it was a really disjointed novel. I'm serious. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. I was having a whale of a time. You thought it was a real modern... uh, Yeah, I thought it was incredibly modern. Okay. Uh, Well, it's from 1993. Yeah. I I was like, wow, this is really some (laughs) postmodernism. It's real experimental. Because I couldn't figure out, like, well, who's the narrator now? Like, what? he's giving oh, that's me no. Funny. He's giving me no context clues for who the narrator is in this chapter, because it'll it'll be in first person a lot. But sometimes it's in third person. I was yep. like, man, he is really playing with the form. <laughs> I- okay, so no going into it that it is short stories, yeah. not a novel. Yeah, <laughs> but it was great. <laughs> Yeah, I can see why that would be extremely confusing, because the novel roughly follows two protagonists, Victor Joseph and Thomas Builds the Fire. It's a sort of bildungsroman, Mm -hmm. which is a thing that we love to say around here. It's just fun. It is great. Which is a coming-of-age story. Right. But it's not like a traditional coming-of-age story. A lot of bildungsromans we've talked about in the past will focus really on just a person's like formative years. So maybe Mm -hmm. from like 14 to 18, and a lot of times even more specifically, like maybe one year of a person's life. This does not do that. They are different ages at different places in the book. There's also a lot of flashbacks uh, that go to when they were growing up together. So it is a little harder to follow. It's it's not a straightforward narrative. Mm-hmm. Don't expect that. And I was expecting that. <laughs> and it was confusing. So here's the reason why I thought it would be a straightforward novel instead of catching mm-hmm. on right away that it was short stories. Because I started watching Spoke Stiggles first. Oh. The movie that is based on these short stories. Yeah. So when you watch the movie, it's made into a cohesive narrative. And so I thought that the whole book of what I now know are short stories was the (laughs) the Smoke Smoke Sniggles story and they just renamed it. I was wrong. (laughs) Gotcha. And that one feels like a like a cohesive story because most of that film is based on one short story in the collection, which is called This Is What It Means to Say Phoenix, Arizona. It's like actually pretty early on in the short stories. It's probably before the halfway point. Mm -hmm. And um, it goes into Victor's dad who left him when he was young has died in Phoenix, Arizona Victor wants to go and reclaim his father's ashes and bring him back to either bury him or scatter his ashes or be able to do something with his dad. And also he wants his pickup truck. So he's trying to find a way to get to Phoenix, Arizona. He's too poor to do it. So Thomas, uh, who nobody really likes, he's a storyteller that nobody listens to. I know. I get it. He's kind of tragic. (laughs) Like we all have that friend, right? Who just like when they open their mouth, you're just like, no, not this again. He's he's (laughs) He's that friend. Um, But he offers to pay for their way down to Arizona. Mm -hmm. And he has good heart. Yeah, he's a very sweet person. Anyway, so that is what Smoke Signal mostly follows. However, there are flashbacks and things that follow the other flashbacks in the short stories. And the title for this actually came to him in a dream. What I hope happened, and I haven't looked at it, is that he had a dream where 
literally the Lone Ranger and Tonto were fist fighting. Mm-hmm. Like, I hope to God that happened, because mm-hmm. that'd be pretty funny. Mm-hmm. But he says that he woke up and that title was in his mind. You said it's to build on this woman. Mm-hmm. I, n- I never feel like I'm getting the right emphasis on the right syllable, syllable. when I say that. Yeah. Uh, I would say it's a lot of slice of life on the reservation yeah, stories absolutely. in general, the whole book, and following different families, and then they're all sort of interweaving with each other. Right, as a community does. Mm-hmm. So... I actually think this is a really great example of a, a like a sprawling sort of narrative where you care about everyone in it without needing to know specifically everything that happens to that person. Mm-hmm. It's more of like a generational tale. And Alexi writes a lot about specifically on the reservations, but just kind of in the American diaspora about uh, poverty and violence and alcoholism and uh, the plight of Indians mm-hmm. in this country. And those who live in poverty. Yeah, specifically a lot of poverty, which, I mean, is just a reality, unfortunately, for a lot of people on the reservation. So it is sad, but it's also funny. Mm-hmm. He's very witty. He's hilarious. He, yeah. Um, and I think it just adds a lot to the book when you can be funny. And he also specifically brings in, obviously, a lot of pop culture references mm-hmm. and a lot of basketball. Sorry, indoor kids. <laughs> um, But a lot of pop culture references to kind of meet that wider audience. It is interesting. He's been asked a lot in like book signings and interviews and stuff. He says he gets confronted a lot by people afterwards who were like, oh, you're making money off of the the Indian story and by like exploiting it. And he was kind of like, do you really think I'm like making that much money off of like (laughs) <laughs> making generic Indian stories. And it's really interesting um, and really tough to talk about in a lot of ways. But I think that he does a good job of presenting the realities in a humorous and tangible way. I think a great example of this is a quote in it that is really playing on. And I think he does get a lot of humor out of playing with and doing satire on the stereotypical idea mm-hmm. of Indians that mainstream America has. Yep. And I think a perfect example of this is from both the book and the movie. <laughs> and it's after Victor's father dies and he sees his old friend Thomas in the grocery store. <laughs> and uh, Mikhail, you read that quote? Yes. So he says, Victor, I'm sorry about your father. And Victor says, how did you know about it? And... <laughs> Thomas says, I heard it on the wind. I heard it from the birds. I felt it in the sunlight. Also, your mother was just in here crying. (laughs) I love that. It's so funny. The movie, it's like perfectly delivered. Mm -hmm. Because I've read this book before. I watched the movie and then I went back and read a couple of the short stories to prep for this. And I heard it in that guy's voice Mm -hmm. as I was reading it. And it was, gosh, it's just so funny. His name is Evan Adams. And I'm Mm going to talk a lot about him later. Oh, you are. Okay. Uh, So Sarah Quirk. In the Dictionary of Library Biography, this ever so exciting resource that you guys are probably so thrilled to hear about. I am. (laughs) I I know, me too, right? Uh, It says that Sherman Alexie's works really examine what does it mean to live as an Indian in this time? What does it mean to be an Indian man? And finally, what does it mean to live on an Indian reservation? Mm -hmm. And this book is a lot of that. It's followed up kind of by Reservation Blues, which is his first actual novel. And in it, Thomas and Victor start a rock and blues band called Coyote Springs. I haven't read Reservation Blues. A lot of people actually don't like it that much because Sherman Alexi is so prosy. uh, He's very poetic and flowy in his writing. A lot of people don't actually think he's that great at writing novels. That doesn't surprise me. He seems very stream of consciousness as if you're Mm -hmm. if you were listening to somebody at like a slam poetry event. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I buy that. I'll read you a couple things, if that's okay. Because I I love the way that he writes. So these are from the first story so that we don't spoil a lot of stuff later on, because it's definitely worth checking out and reading the entire short story collection. So, Victor imagined that his father's tears could have frozen solid in the severe reservation winters and shattered when they hit the floor, sent millions of icy knives through the air, each specific and beautiful, each dangerous and random. And then later on, during all of these kinds of tiny storms, Victor's mother would rise with her medicine and magic. She would pull air down from empty cupboards and make fry bread. She would shake thick blankets free from old bandanas. She would comb Victor's braids into dreams. That's good. It's real good. (laughs) Uh, That whole first story in there, I think, is wonderful. It's uh, about a hurricane that hits the reservation in 1976, but it's not an actual hurricane. It is because we are in the inland. (laughs) Yeah. So the part of the country we live in is the inland 
northwest. Correct. Uh, we live in the Inland Empire. In yep. fact. So there's no hurricanes here. Actually, the hurricane is his two uncles, like, duking it out mm-hmm. on the front lawn. Let's get into the movie. So Smoke Signals is remarkable in that it came out in 1998, and it is the first all-Indian movie made. Mm-hmm. It has all-Indian actors. The cast and crew are all made up of tribal members, and um, it's directed by Chris Ayer, who is Cheyenne and Arapaho. Sherman Alexi wrote the screenplay, and then, like I said, the entire cast and crew, all Native. So, mm-hmm. uh, And it's funny. It's hilarious. It's a, it's a, it's a great <laughs> it's movie. It's just a great movie. It did take top honors at Sundance, and it's 86% fresh uh, on Rotten Tomatoes. Nice. Yeah. Uh, it has been inducted into the National Film Registry of the Library of Congress mm-hmm. because of its, quote, cultural, historic, and aesthetic importance to our nation's film heritage. Nice. It was made on just a budget of $2 million, wow. and it was mostly filmed on the Coeur d'Alene Reservation, so... Like we said, that's uh, about, what, half an hour south mm-hmm. of, of Coeur d'Alene, the city proper in northern Idaho, with locations in Plummer, Worley, DeSmet, and Tensed, which, we're here at the library. We've got okay. libraries there, guys. We have libraries there that we send books to. Yes, we do. So if you live in any of those cities, we share books with you. Yes, we do. <laughs> uh, they also did some filming in Spokane and Soap Lake, Washington. Okay. So uh, basically, Eastern Washington. Yeah. If you have ever made the very long and arduous trek towards Seattle, it's a or long Portland, drive. It is a long drive, but you will recognize a lot of the scenery from this film. Mm-hmm. There were parts of it where, like, a mountain would go by, and I was like, "I have seen that mountain. Mm-hmm. I, <laughs> I know that field. Um, it's kind of cool because I definitely do recognize many places in it." Yeah, the drive from Eastern Washington to Seattle is. Really unexpected if you're not from this part of the world. <laughs> I was like, wait, there's a desert out here? Mm-hmm. I think there's three biomes in Washington State. Oh, tell. There's Rainforest by Seattle. Then okay. there is the desert. Mm-hmm. And then there's a, like, there's a different name for like the rolling hills hmm. in like southeastern Washington. Plains. Plains. Yeah. Prairie. Okay. I'm from here. Didn't know that. Yeah. Washington has three biomes. Excellent. Fun fact. Go watch him tonight. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. You want me on trivia night? Oh, yeah. That trek is. I mean, I made it last week and I was bored out of my gourd. So, yeah, it's it's amazing and spectacular the first five times you drive it. <laughs> and then you better have some podcasts to listen to. Yep. It's pretty sparsely populated. Yes. But there's bunkers out there. Have you seen the bunkers? No. Oh, there's some military bunkers and oh. stuff if you're headed out that Interesting. way. Interesting. Also, you know, King County. Largest apple producer in the United States. So you can go through I some didn't real know nice. That. Yeah, some real nice apple fields and stuff out there if you go the right mm. way. I don't know. It's kind of fun. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so, you know, part of the movie takes place in Arizona, of course. And so for that, they use Cooley City, which mm-hmm. is by the Cooley Dam. Mm-hmm. And for instance, the Phoenix bus station in the movie was played, quote unquote, <laughs> by the former Spokane Greyhound station at Sprague Avenue and Madison Street. Okay. Sorry. It's Sprague. Okay. <laughs> I've also been saying Gonzaga That's wrong a, for a long I, time. I know. Gonzaga. That sounds... It's wrong. I know. That's okay. I accept <laughs> that. So Sprague. Sprague. That sounds more Minnesotan than how I say it. Sprague. Like, Sprague. you really gotta put it through your nose. <laughs> it's Sprague. Okay. <laughs> and also, uh, Riverfront Park features in the film's final scene, mm-hmm. um, where he keeps saying he's gonna go to the falls. Right. That's Riverfront Park, and that's also where the World's Fair, the Expo 74, was in mm-hmm. Spokane. And you can still see the uh, the pavilion, mm-hmm. which now lights up, and it's uh, it's great. Yeah, it's a really gorgeous. It looks park. Real it's nice. a fun fun way to spend an afternoon. There's also a gondola there now, so you can go down like to the falls and back. That sounds terrifying, but I'm glad it's there. I did it once, and I would never do it again. Yeah, no, but thank it was you. fun. <laughs> um, yeah, so lots of things that you would probably recognize. In the book, they also talk about uh, one time Thomas walks to the falls, and Victor's dad finds him there. Is like, kid, what are you doing here? This is so far away from the reservation, and takes him down to Denny's. It um, really is very far. It's a long way. Like, at least 20 miles. But they go to Denny's. Have you been to Denny's? Like, ever? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It's a chain. De- okay, but this... Speci- I'm oh, sorry, there's not oh, Denny's. You- Dick's. They go to Dick's. Oh, yeah. That's right. On Div- I'm sorry. In the movie, he takes them to Denny's. Yes. In the, In the book, book, they go to Dick's. So, is Dick's one where it's like, buy and buy the sack full? Yes. Oh. It's great. Okay, describe Dick's. Okay, so Dick's is like this... 
old fashioned greasy burger joint that's yeah, right on Division alone. Street. Right on the corner if you get off at the Division exit. Is its mascot a mouse or a bear? It is a panda bear, I'm pretty sure. It's it's like one of those 1950s mascots where like uh, yeah. they like <laughs> have they seen one before? Mm-mm. No. Definitely not. <laughs> Um, So you can't really tell what animal it is. Yeah. It's like the sloppiest, greasiest burger joint you could possibly go to. And it's a walk up window. You can only get it and go. And then you have to, like, protect your food from the gulls. (laughs) Because they will steal your fries right out of your hands. I love this place. Like, my grandma and I used to go because we love it. My Grammy, I should say, uh, likes to be a very classy lady. So if we want to class it up, we call it Richard's. Oh, like Target Target. Exactly. Yeah. So we'll be like, we're going to Richard's. I like that. Uh, yeah. I like that. So Dick's downtown. Okay. So what's the thing to get there? What? A Dick's. Oh, just like a burger and fries and a shake. Your regular. Yeah. Do they do a special sauce? I don't think so. I, I mean, it's literally like the most basic. Like just shut up and eat it. it yeah. Situation. Okay. Yep. Got it. Got it. It's super cheap food. You can buy a bag of fries for like. Like you're going to have a stomach ache, but it, it's worth it. It's so worth it. Got it. Got so, it. Sorry. Long tangent. Real good restaurant. See Richards. So uh, can we talk about some of the people in this movie? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to get to Evan Adams because yeah, I know you said. I have a whole thing about him. a whole thing about Evan Adams. So I'll get to him last. Uh, it has Adam Beach as Victor Joseph. I love Adam Beach because he was in SVU for a while. That's how I know him. Yeah. Who does he play? Uh, Chester. Oh my uh, God, somebody. that's I can't him. Remember the last name. Yeah. Oh, I thought he looked so familiar. Yeah, that's that guy. Oh. Um, so he's in SBU, which is a show that Roxanne and I both very much enjoy. Law and Order Special Victims Unit. Yes. Dunk, thank dunk. You. <laughs> Get out. <laughs> <laughs> he also plays in the brand new Nancy Drew from the CW. That's real trashy. I tell you Ooh, about. Oh yeah. That I love, even though it's trashy. Um, he plays Chief McGinnis. Oh, okay. And Nancy Drew. He also plays Slipknot in Suicide Squad, if you're into that. I've never seen it. He was in Suicide... Yes. Mm-hmm. Yes! <laughs> oh so apparently my he's real stealthy. He's just in a bunch of stuff Roxanne has just seen. Just low-key and all this stuff. Yeah. I'm just... just in the background. She's never noticed. My goodness. That's Victor. I'm so glad you told me all this. I, I'm so glad you, like, didn't know. I just didn't... could not no, place that's so him. so funny. And I even, like, imd beat him, but clearly didn't get that far back. Right. Or that far forward. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, his SBU stint was pretty. Google early was on. not forthcoming with me. <laughs> oh my! <laughs> it's failed us. Yeah. Okay. It also has Irene Bedard as Susie Song. Do you know who she is? Very pretty lady. A very very beautiful woman. She's also the voice of Pocahontas. Yeah. In, in the Disney movie Pocahontas. Mm-hmm. She's in the new Westworld series. Okay. Okay. Uh, she plays someone with a pretty stereotypical name. I'm pretty sure. Okay. I just don't remember what. I yeah. didn't write it down because I don't enjoy Westworld that much. First season's good, second season meh. Accurate. Yeah. Yep. And then it has Gary Farmer as Arnold Joseph. And he looked familiar. He did. So I thought that same thing. I looked through his IMDb and I didn't recognize a whole bunch of stuff, but I know I've seen him in stuff. So maybe he's a character actor. Yeah. That, I don't know. I don't know. Gosh, he looked familiar. But he is also in... Like, I feel like he's played a football coach in something. Doesn't he seem like he oh, would, could play a football coach? He could be a football coach. He's got that, like, like he's big that voice. Yeah. He could do that. He is in Winter in the Blood. What's that? Which I mentioned because it's based on a novel by James Welch, okay. who is another native author. And the movie version of it was produced by Sherman Alexie oh, in cool. 2012. So it's kind of like a full circle. Winter in the Blood is also a pretty decent book, if you want to pick that one up. James Welch. So those are my other people I'll mention now. Tell me about Evan Adams. Evan Adams. <laughs> oh, my God. I love him. Mm-hmm. I would normally call him a national treasure, but he does not belong to us. He is Canadian. That's true. Canadian First Nations. He is part of the Slyamun tribe. And the reason I'm saying that haltingly is I had to phonetically spell it out. It's actually spelled like T L A apostrophe A M N E N. I could be misspelling that. So just linguistically, there's different. Right. Sounds. So, uh, Slyamon, I think, is how you pronounce it, which is a uh, a band that is from Powell River region of British Columbia. And since I used to live in Vancouver, <laughs> I've been to the, the areas where he grew up. So that makes him part of uh, the Salish First Nations, which are essentially all of the um, sort of like seafaring coastal First Nation bands. And the first time you said band, I thought you were talking about like a literal band. Like a oh sorry yeah <laughs> no it's okay. and the reason I'm calling them First Nations is they don't use the term Indian at all 
right, in, Canada, in Canada, it's almost entirely First Nation is how they also refer to themselves. But I could be wrong because everyone has different ways of deciding what their identity is. But <laughs> Evan Adams is really smart. And so, like I said, he plays Thomas Builds the Fire. He went on after that to complete a medical doctorate from the University of Calgary in 2002. Hmm. So he is a medical doctor. He did his residency at the Aboriginal Family Practice Program at St. Paul's Hospital in Vancouver, BC, which I walked by every day. <laughs> it's this really beautiful old hospital. Dr. Adams also has a <laughs> master's of public health from John Hopkins University. Wow. But what I think is the coolest fact about him now is he's currently the chief medical officer of the First Nations Health Authority of Canada. This guy? Yeah. No Thomas way. with the big smile and the glasses. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. He's such a cutie. I love him. Oh, that's I just, awesome. We need more Evan Adams and Thomas Builds a Fire, I think, we in, do. in our world. Yeah. And you know what I liked in the movie? Hmm. The actor who plays his grandmother, <laughs> they look like they would be related. They do. Like, they have exactly the same smile. <laughs> Did you notice that? I did. And yeah. she's, so, she's and they have the same build. So tiny. Yeah. yeah. And he's a really tiny man. A real tiny person. It's just, I love how they did the casting to make yeah. it look like they're actually related to each other. Oh, that's cute. They also gave her big glasses. The big like glasses. His. And he's yeah. Big glasses. Perfect. He's so funny. He's basic. He's like a square, right? He wears like these plaid suits like with like vests. Suits. Yeah. And has these real like Coke bottle glasses. Mm-hmm. And like partway through the movie, Victor kind of rags on him. Like they've got kind of a love hate relationship anyway, right? Like, They've grown, it's like your cousins, right? Like you've grown up together and like sometimes you're jealous of each other and sometimes you get along great, but like you kind of can't tell if you want to like punch each other, like hug each other. It's definitely a big brother, little brother dynamic. Yeah. Green beans are mixed bags. <laughs> We're onions. Wait, right? That yeah. is the theme today. I mean, truly. <laughs> Because a lot of this book deals with, and a lot of the movie, but I think you get a little more into it in the book. Amazing transition, by the way. <laughs> Thank you. Beats Victor at some times. He beats Victor's mom at some points. He ends up leaving when Victor is maybe like 12, 13. The adolescent kind of formative years there. And just doesn't talk to his family anymore. It's it's heartbreaking, right? Mm-hmm. Like, it, it obviously affects Victor's entire relationships with his mom with Thomas, with everyone around. But he's not an all bad human being. In the movie, and I don't, you can remind me because I haven't read the whole book recently. In the movie, you find out that he is responsible for causing the fire that kills Thomas's parents. Mm -hmm. Is that in the book too? I can't remember. No. I didn't think so. No. So in the movie, he's responsible for that fire. So there's a big party. He is lighting fireworks, sets the house on fire. When he's drunk. When he's drunk. Everyone in the house dies except for Thomas, who is a baby, and they throw him out the window to save him. And Victor's dad, who is Arnold in the movie, Mm -hmm. not in the book, Arnold catches Victor. So everyone's like, oh, he saved Victor's life. And then you find out that's kind of not the case because he's the one who imperiled it in the first place. Mm -hmm. So you find all this out. Victor and Thomas get to Phoenix and find out from Arnold's new flame, her name is Susie Song, that he has lived with a lot of guilt for his entire life. He has never not thought about that fire. There's not a day that goes by that he hasn't thought about it. And he's a really decent human being to Susie. He's a decent sort of human being later on in his life when he's not around memories of this terrible thing that he has done in mm-hmm. the past. So, a real mixed bag of human being. One thing I thought was interesting in how they had to adapt the book to the movie mm-hmm. is things like his flame in the movie is named Susie Song. In the book, she's sort of a just a random character, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. It's like, oh, and then Susie Song was there. Right. So he took all these names and then just sort of used them and transposed them onto bigger characters in the movie. Mm-hmm. And he also did that a lot with quotes or sort of right. tropes or situations. Like, so for instance, I think one of the the big memorable scenes from the movie is the the two young women. Oh yeah, who have a car that <laughs> only drives backwards. Yes, uh, and they're and they're hilarious. And they also have a quote that's from the book. So both the situation of having a car that only drives backwards <laughs> and the this quote where she says, hand me a beer. And then she goes, oh, remember, we don't drink anymore. <laughs> and then she says, how about give me a Coke instead? Right. And she's like, but we have Coke. And so they drink Coke. What I also think is funny is that there must have been some sort of product placement, either from Coke mm. or Pepsi wouldn't give them the rights because in the book, he's obsessed with Diet Pepsi. Oh, yeah. Everyone drinks Diet Pepsi all the time Mm -hmm. in the movie she says okay hand me a coke then so i wonder what the rights issues were there oh i wasn't paying attention so i accidentally this is why even 
catalogers, you guys don't pay attention to the catalog all the time. When I went to check out this movie from the library... This I, happened to me, too. Did it? Okay. I accidentally checked out the screenplay mm-hmm. instead of the film. Yep. <laughs> because I wasn't paying attention to material type, which is something you gotta pay attention you to. You gotta pay attention to material type. <laughs> so, <clears throat> I accidentally ended up with the screenplay. It was delightful. Mm. I read through, uh, like, the introduction and the outro and stuff because I was like, mm-hmm. well, there's probably some interesting information in here. Totally was. I didn't pay attention. It did say who sponsored the movie, and I wasn't paying attention. I bet it was Coke. Probably was. They did say, however, Michelle St. John and Elaine Miles, and that's the two ladies we were just talking about who were in the backwards car. They're wonderful. <clears throat> they are. Sherman Alexi says, quote, they give what may be the most resiest Indian performance in cinematic history. These performances are not the result of years of training and study on how to act like an Indian. They're the results of years of living as an Indian, of years of being Indian. Note to all other filmmakers, cast Indians as Indians because you'll get better performance. Amen. Yeah. They actually had another scene planned for them at the end of the movie, and it didn't work out thematically for that to Mm -hmm. be in there. And he says he was so sad that they had to cut it because he says that the scene that they cut from the end was funnier than the one that they're in at the beginning, which I can't imagine. is is perfect. (laughs) It's so good. Here's some other things I learned from reading Sherman Alexie's intro and stuff, which I thought were really interesting. He says, I mean it. I really love movies. I always have. I love movies more than I love books. And believe me, I love books more than I love every human being. (laughs) Except the dozen or so people in my life who love movies and books just as much as I do. So I thought that was really funny because even though he's, I always think of him first and foremost as a poet, he thinks of himself first and foremost as like a filmmaker, which is kind of fascinating. He has a book of poetry called The Business of Fancy Dancing that also got adapted into a film. Oh, what was in two thousand two, I th- it's just called the business. Of oh, Fancy okay. Dancing, but adapted from his work that he worked on, and Evan Adams is in it. I love him. I know. <laughs> okay, so that's one thing I learned from there. He does also acknowledge that although Smoke Signals is the first feature film written, directed, and co-produced by Indians to ever receive a major distribution deal, there have been many other Indian filmmakers. Uh, our elders who made wonderful films that have been wrongfully ignored or dismissed. Mm. So he gives a lot of credit to people who've come before. Uh, he also dedicates his book to yeah. all Indian writers and poets, he says, who have uh, inspired him. Right. And he has a, a quote in there, an epigraph from Joy Harjo, the current poet laureate of the United States. And how long do they get to stay laureate for? I think that it's it's terms, and she's actually just been elected to like a third term. Oh, okay. But I think that she's going to be up for, re, I guess, reappointment, re-election. Yeah, yeah. I, I think it's an appointed position pretty soon here. Because that said, November of 2020 was the last time she got elected in. But she put out a book of poetry recently called An American Sunrise. Okay. That was cool. Pretty good. I want to mention one theme that I've noticed a ton in his work. Mm-hmm. And because you studied his background more. Sure. Wondering what you found out. The theme of house fires. Oh, you know that didn't come up. a big deal in his books. Well... I just, in my research, it didn't... Yeah, so of course, in the book and the movie, there is a house fire Mm -hmm. that imperils Thomas's life and kills his family. Mm -hmm. But in Sherman's real life, and he brings this up in the absolutely true True. story of a part-time Indian, his parents went through a house fire, I believe, when he was young, and that's why they decided to quit drinking, I believe, in the book. Hmm. But also in the book, his older sister, who moved to Montana, dies in a house fire. So his sister did actually die in a house fire. Also in You Don't Have to Say You Love Me, I believe he also talks about house fire that happened. Because this keeps coming up in different ways, that his parents, when he was very young, had a big party. And I think in the movie it's 4th of July, but I think in what it really happened, it was a New Year's Eve party, and I believe there was a house fire. Mm -hmm. That's something that keeps getting worked in. Well, that's something for someone to do some uh, Sherman Alexie scholarship on. Mm -hmm. Why is fire a recurring theme, and specifically house fire? Mm -hmm. I mean, I have some theories. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's it's a huge autobiographical dramatic event that... Right. But also, I mean, fire in a lot of literature represents, like, cleansing or rebirth Mm -hmm. or um, sort of a, a renewal so I'd be really curious. But obviously because fire is both tragic and in some cases good. I mean, you can't have new growth unless mm-hmm. things have burned. And But in his case, it's so, so traumatic with people dying. Right. I just wonder if it's sort of like a like a spiritual rebirth or like a metaphysical restart. I don't know. Any any Sherman Alexi scholars out there? Yeah. Let please, us know. Please write in. Tell us. <laughs> I hadn't paid enough attention, but I will. I 
I do have another quote from the movie that I think is just funny. They get in a car accident in the movie Mm -hmm. as they're leaving Phoenix. And they're in the hospital talking to uh, a woman who was involved in the accident later. Victor has run like 15 miles to the nearest town to like get an ambulance to come back and like help the people in his boots which uh, like jeans. cowboy boots and jeans and i can't even imagine i can't run i can't run in like sneakers <laughs> i don't want to think about running in your like your cowboy boots so he's run to the nearest town saves these people he's in the hospital visiting the one lady and she says you guys are heroes you know you're like the lone ranger in tonto and thomas says no we're more like tonto and tonto yeah i loved that i think it's so funny and he's just so innocent about it. He's so smiley and like I love him. Funny. Yeah. He's he's wonderful. So I don't think there's a lot more to be said. I, I want you to read it because I, I don't want to spoil anything that happens in it. Not that anything happens per se. It's not a plot heavy mm-hmm. book, but it is a heavy on feelings and emotions book. So be ready to do some some emotional unpacking mm-hmm. as you're reading through. You know what's disappointed about the book is hmm. like I usually listen to the books that we read right. because I'm trying to get through so many of them right. for various projects. Oh, uh, you know. I, I do know. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I, I like to listen to books on tape. There does not exist a recording of Todd on Lone Ranger, Fist Fight in Heaven. Well, that's a bummer. I know. Not an audible. I could. I wanted to give them my money. Yeah. They're not to be found. <laughs> so I had to read it. Okay. Here's another project for you guys out there. Convince Sherman Alexi that there needs well, to be an say, I don't want it unless Sherman Alexi reads uh, yeah. it. Because he reads... Oh, he would be great. Well, he reads the audiobook of both The Absolutely True Diary of a Part-Time Indian mm-hmm. and uh, You Don't Have to Say You Love Me. So he's a wonderful narrator. Yeah. He's a real good speaker, too. I've, I've listened to him at, like, various... So, yeah, please read the book. It's an excellent book. I actually recommend everything I've ever read by him, mm-hmm. uh, which includes, I think, all of the things we've talked about today, except for Reservation Blues. I've not read that. Yeah. And I really love some of his poetry, especially The Summer of Black Widows. Okay. That's, like, my favorite of his poetry. Is that a poetry book? Mm Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. Um, It's fantastic. I got introduced to to it in a literature class in college, and that's why I came around to Sherman Alexi in the first place. Cool. I want to point out one more connection that ties into our Stephen King episode. Oh, okay. Because I mentioned this back when we did The Shining. I said that Sherman Alexi considers King one of his big influences. Oh, yeah. And so... He specifically um, loves Carrie, which came out in 1974. And quote I have is, you know, it's about a high school misfit with telekinetic powers. And Sherman Alexi says it revealed to him the, quote, eventual power of being an outsider. That which makes you a freak when you're 12 makes you magical when you're 24. Ooh. Hope for all of us and our kids. (laughs) It eventually gets better. (laughs) It does. You can go work in a library. Oh, <laughs> yeah. It's a great place to work, you guys. No, it really is. They let us do this. So yeah, it's awesome. It's fun. <laughs> so here's some things I want to recommend. If you do like Sherman Alexi or if you think you're going to like Sherman Alexi, I do highly recommend you read Winter in the Blood by James Welch. We yeah. talked about the movie a little bit, but the book is, is really good. Uh, you should read some things by Louise Erdrich, who is from Minnesota. <laughs> yes, she is. <laughs> I brought it up this time, so it's fine. Yeah. Um, I specifically love, she has a three book cycle that consists of The Plague of Doves, The Roundhouse, and La Rose. Okay. Those are my favorites. Our uh, boss, Jennifer, really likes The Last Report of the Miracles at Little No Horse. And I'm familiar with the Master Butcher's Singing Club. Yes. Which they made into a play choice. Yeah. But also, she's written a bunch of stuff. She's got children's books that I read as a child growing Mm -hmm. up, and I really loved The Birch Bark House and that whole series. Mm -hmm. And she is part Ojibwe. Right. Which is uh, a tribe from northern Minnesota. Mm-hmm. Ojibwe, Anishinaabe. I went home to Minnesota and I told Michaela I was going to get her something tacky, but I actually got her some authentic Ojibwe wild rice And soup. it was delicious. I mean, it's good it stuff. so good. <laughs> I also recommend The Grapes of Wrath by John Steinbeck. Also deals heavily with themes of poverty, the social cultural gap between the haves and the haves not. Hat? You know what I meant. The haves, the have nots. Yep. And I also recommend One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest by Ken Kesey. And why are, do you recommend that in relation to this episode? Sure. It'd be um, funny to be like, <laughs> no reason. No, just because <laughs> I like it. Uh, he's also semi-local. He's an Oregonian. Oh, I didn't so, know that. Yeah. So that kind of plays in. But I also recommend it, A, because he has an Indian character in there who may or may not be depicted well, but it's still an interesting piece of the conversation. Mm-hmm. Uh, but also because it talks a lot about alienation and it's got a really satirical, like witty bite to it. Hmm. So it's like thematically similar, but also the tonal similarity. I smell an upcoming episode. 
I can't wait. Yeah, I, we should talk about that. Okay. So we really appreciate you guys tuning in with us again. Uh, it would mean a lot if you would rate and review us on Apple Podcasts. The only thing it does it just makes it easier for other people to find us. And we have an email address now, which is podcast at communitylibrary.net. We would just love to hear any feedback you have. Please be nice. Yeah. And, and your Alexi scholarship should come straight to our <laughs> inbox. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, we'd specifically love to hear where you're listening from. Just because we're nosy. <laughs> right. We also want to mention that anything that we have talked about on the podcast today is available to borrow through the Community Library Network. Sure is. Either because we have it or we will get it for you from we another will. library. We'll track it down. <laughs> <laughs> we'll make them give it to us. Yeah. Um, we're real aggressive librarians. Just kidding. <laughs> Which we're compared to everyone else is like not aggressive Not even at all. a little bit. Yeah. No. <laughs> So, we do appreciate you guys hanging out with us. We definitely recommend this book and this movie very highly. And we can't wait to talk at you next time. All right. See so, ya. Yeah, we need a tagline at the we end. We do. We'll, we'll work on it. Okay. Okay. See you next time. <laughs> <laughs>say it's a little like our relationship Michaela, <laughs> where one of us is unfailingly positive and one of us is a jerk yeah <laughs> familiar with if you do live in the area sacred heart never heard of it yeah. <laughs> you know how i was walt disney and you were Keel travers uh yeah yeah i buy that okay that's a minnesotaism no it's a youth internet no. thing <laughs> is it untrue no did i hurt your feelings no <laughs> aha uh, like, like you just got me or something. I, just, I know. Like, take that. I kind of feel like I did. Like ha, you didn't know that. <laughs> I don't have feelings you can hurt. So, <laughs> and yet I'm the one who doesn't cry. I know. Weird. Because how many hundreds of miles away are we from the ocean? A many. And I was like, I'm Thomas. No, it's here. totally fine. Can I leave that in? <clears throat> yeah.